together. I want to invite you to come with me to the book of Psalms and to Psalm 135. Psalm 135. The Word of God has much to teach us about praise by way of precept and practice, by way of exhortation and example. The psalmist in Psalm 50 verse 23 says, They that offer praise glorify the Lord. And if you've been familiar with the uh, Westminster Shorter Catechism, you know that the answer to the opening question is man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. It was a great Puritan, John Calvin, who said, The most holy service that we can render to God is to be employed in praising his name. John MacArthur writes and says, The music of praise arises from a heart that is fixed on God, a heart that is settled on God. There was a great Methodist preacher and hymn writer Charles Wesley who said, When your heart is full of Christ, you want to sing. When your heart is full of Christ, you want to to sing. So with that in mind, let's turn to this uh, psalm. Psalm 135. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise him, O you servants of the Lord, you who stand in the house of the Lord and the courts of the house of our God. Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing praises to his name, for it is pleasant. For the Lord has chosen Jacob for himself, Israel, for his special treasure. For I know that the Lord is great, and our Lord is above all gods. Whatever the Lord pleases, he does, in heaven and on earth, in the sea and in all deep places. He causes the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. He makes lightning for the rain. He brings the wind out of his treasures. He destroyed the firstborn of Egypt, both of man and beast. He sent signs and wonders into the midst of you, O Egypt, upon Pharaoh and all his servants. He defeated many nations and slew mighty kings. Sion, king of the Amorites, all king of Bashan, and all the kingdoms of Canaan, and gave their land as a heritage, a heritage uh, to Israel, his people. Your name, O Lord, endures forever. Your fame, O Lord, throughout all generations for the Lord will judge his people he will have compassion on his servants the idols of the nations are silver and gold the work of men's hands they have mouths but they do not speak they have eyes but they do not see they have ears but they do not hear nor is there any breath in their mouths those who make them are like them so is everyone who trusts in them bless the Lord O house of Israel, bless the Lord, O house of Aaron, bless the Lord, O house of Levi, you who fear the Lord, bless the Lord, blessed be the Lord out of Zion, who dwells in Jerusalem, praise the Lord. And this is God's word, and we thank God for his word. Father, with our Bibles open, we bow humbly now in your presence. We thank you for the opportunity to read the scriptures. We thank you for the Holy Spirit whom you've given to us to witness to us with our spirit that we are your children. And we thank you that he is the interpreter. He is the one who leads us and guides us into all truth. And may that be our experience this evening. Lord, maybe we've had a busy day, a difficult day, Maybe this is the last place we wanted to be this evening. And maybe there are matters uh, that we have to attend to on the morrow. And it's so easy for these things to crowd in upon us and rob us of a sense of your presence and your peace and your blessing. May that not be so, but may we hear your voice tonight. And may you minister to us according to our need. We pray this in Jesus' name and for Christ's sake. Amen. The late... David Livingstone had one consuming compassion and that was to reach the world for Christ. 
That was the burning ambition within his heart and soul. Having received a medical degree from the University of Glasgow, he joined the London Missionary Society and went to Southern Africa where he labored to open up Africa for the gospel of Jesus Christ. One of the key passages of scripture that stirred his soul and moved his will was this psalm, Psalm 135. It was with this psalm that David Livingstone said a farewell to his family and home in Blantyre in Scotland to go to Africa. Listen to what his sister wrote concerning that occasion. She writes, I remember my father and him talking over the prospect of Christian mission. They agreed the time would come when rich men and great men would think it an honor to support entire stations of missionaries instead of spending their money on hounds and horses. On the morning of the 17th of November 1841, we got up at 5 a.m. My mother made coffee, read Psalm 121 and Psalm 135 and prayed. My father and David walked to Glasgow to catch the Liverpool steamer. David Livingstone never saw his father again. With Psalm 135 ringing in his ears, he headed to Africa to spend over three decades serving Christ under the most adverse conditions. What was it about this psalm that captivated the heart of this pioneer missionary? Why did he read this psalm as he left home for Africa? What made this sacred song so dear to him? What was there about it that inspired him to go to Africa for 32 years and serve God until the Lord called him home to glory? Well, the answer to all these questions lay in the fact that he believed that his God was a great God. We sometimes sing in the hearing of our boys and girls, our God is a great big God. What do we mean by that? Well, this psalm helps us to formulate our thinking about the greatness of our God. Some years ago, there was a book written, and the title of the book was simply this, Your God is too small. Your God is too small. Here is a psalm that lifts high the name of our God and calls his people to praise him from whom all blessings flow. Here is a psalm that lifts high the great name of our awesome God. There's a clarion call here to praise the Lord, to praise God from whom all blessings flow, to praise the one true God over all the earth. There's a passionate plea to come and to worship God, the one true and living God, the God who is Lord over all, over all creation and all nations, the God who is our creator, the God who gives us the very breath that we breathe, the God in whom we live and move and have our being. The author on occasion is unknown, probably after the exile of God's people. But the message is very clear. Across the 21 verses that go to make up this psalm, there are two words that are prominent. And those two words are, praise God. The God of creation. The God who is over all nations. The God in whom we have redemption. Notice the psalm commences and concludes with this great theme. And no matter where you cut into the psalm, you will find this exhortation coming to you again and again to praise God. And I want just for a moment to unpack this psalm for you this evening as we walk through it. And the first thing I want to draw your attention to is here we have the invitation to praise God. We have the invitation to praise God. Verse 1, three times in the opening verse, believers are called upon to praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Uh, praise him, O you servants of the Lord. 
You who stand in the house of the Lord, in the courts of the house of our God, uh, praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing praises to his name, for it is pleasant. Those who are expert in languages of the Bible would tell us that to repeat in the Hebrew language something three times is to reach a superlative that says there is nothing more to add to what is being said. These verses say it all. And we see from this opening verse that to praise God is to reach the highest goal and to display the greatest passion and to engage in the most spiritual activity. The Hebrew word here for praise simply means to boast. The psalmist here is inviting us to boast in God, uh, to boast about God, to be taken up with God, and with God and God alone. You see, uh, there is none his equal. He is far and above and beyond all things. Look at where praise is to come from. It is to come from those who stand or who minister in the house of the Lord, in the courts of the house of our God. These are the ones who serve him in the temple. He's referring here to public praise. He's referring here to public worship. I don't know about you, but I was delighted when uh, the doors of the church that I'm involved in in Cumber were open and we could gather for public worship. You know, I, I become concerned uh, when I met people and I said to them, uh, uh, when do you hope to get back? Uh, and they said, well, to tell you the truth, uh, I'm not really concerned. And I said, what do you mean? And they were very happy to have their coffee uh, wearing their jammies and their fresh scones at 11 o'clock on a Sunday morning to go online. And of course they had the uh, delete button uh, and they had the other button that allowed them to church hop. And I believe that some of God's people have got into that mode. And it's a very dangerous mode. David says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go unto the house of the Lord. And I'm sure some of you, if not most of you, are frustrated. And I hope your frustrations are alleviated very soon and that you'll be free to open your mouths and sing praise unto our God. We do that in Cumber, but don't tell anybody. And if John MacArthur's going to put, be put in prison for doing it, I'm happy to be in the next cell so long as I can go into his cell every morning and sit at his feet and learn from his exposition. But I'm sure you miss praising God. And I'm sure you're here tonight because you want to be here. Because there's a desire in your heart. There's a desire in your soul. You believe in the biblical principle of not neglecting the gathering of ourselves together as the manner of some is. The public gatherings of God's people is a New Testament principle that has been established by God for his people. The coming together into the house of the Lord. And there is nothing dull and drab or dreary here. There is nothing that is frothy and frivolous, lacking in depth and thought. The focus here of their praise is God and God alone. Have they known the words of that hymn they have sing? Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art. The invitation to praise God. Notice in verses 3 through to 18, there is the motivation to praise God. The motivation to praise God. The writer um, motivates his readers to praise God because of who he is and because of what he has done. You will see in verse 3, he says, God is good. It simply means he is beneficial. Do you remember what the psalmist says in Psalm 103? Praise the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. It's a positive statement. 
reminding us that he gives us what we need. He will not satisfy our greed, but he will certainly meet our need. And you can say with me this evening that surely goodness and mercy has followed us all the days of our lives. And surely that calls for praise. Sing to his name, says the psalmist, for that is good, that is pleasant. What does it mean? Uh, well, it says, sing to his name. Well, God's name represents his holy attributes. When we think of God's name, we think of the perfection of his character. He is pleasant. And our worship should reflect our deep appreciation of his bounty and of his beauty. God is good. Remember the little chorus? God is so good. He's so good to me. I remember singing that years ago when the children were small and one day uh, Gareth was out in the car and there was no inhibitions there. You could stand in the wee hump and he was standing in the hump and I was singing away. And we came to that second verse, Now I am free. And he tapped me on the shoulder and he says, Daddy, I'm not free, I'm four. Uh, and uh, I always remind him of that. But isn't it good to be able to sing, Now I am free. No condemnation, as I said on Sunday morning. Now we dread Jesus and all in him is mine. We praise God for his goodness. There is an appreciation here of his bounty and his beauty. And then he says, he has chosen Jacob for himself. Old Jacob, the twister, the schemer, the deceiver. What a humbling truth here that disarms and dismisses any pride. Here we're reminded of God's sovereign grace, of God's electing love. He called me long before I heard, before I took him at his word. He called me. He found me bruised and dying. He poured in oil and wine. He whispered to assure me, I found thee. Thou art mine. I never heard a sweeter voice. It made my aching heart rejoice. Oh, the love that sought me. Oh, the blood that bought me. Oh, the grace that brought me to the fold. Wondrous grace that brought me to the fold. Here we're reminded of God's sovereign grace and elected love. A love that is sweet and satisfying to the spiritual man or woman. For reasons, <laughs> not only to himself, God chose his own people for himself unto eternal life. And from humble hearts there rises a volume of praise. Oh, tonight we thank God for his goodness. We thank God that he has chosen us for himself, not because there was any good thing in us that commended us to the love of God. Read Ephesians chapter 2, we were dead in trespasses and in sin. We were dominated by the God of this world. We were going to a lost eternity, but God, but God who is rich in mercy, commended his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Praise belongs to God because he is good. Praise to Lord belongs to God because he has chosen us for himself. We are his special treasure. I love that little song that we would sing, maybe in the company of the boys and girls. I'm special because God loves me. And then, of course, as we continue our walk, we see that this God is not only good and this God has not only chosen us for himself but in verses 5 to 7 we see that he is great he is great great in his authority to reign and rule over all greater than all man made gods and he displays this by doing whatever pleases him here we're confronted with the sovereignty and authority of our great God he rules the winds and the waves. He stills the storm and calms the troubled sea. He says, peace, be still. He makes clouds arise. He sends lightning 
and he brings out the wind. How great is our God. Verses 8 to 12, we see his supreme power. There's a reference here to the ten plagues of Egypt with which God struck the Egyptians when Pharaoh refused to let God's people go. God has struck down many nations, not just Egypt. He has destroyed kings in addition to Pharaoh. Many have felt the fury of God's wrath and were ushered into the great eternity as a consequence of their sinful rejection, forsaking the living and true God for worthless idols. Doesn't the Bible tell us that it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of an angry God? He defeated and destroyed nation after nation who opposed his people and stood in the way of his plan and purpose. And in doing so, he displayed his supreme power. What a God. Take a step back tonight. And in the midst of all that is happening around us, in the midst of all that our ears are listening to, focus on God tonight. Remind your heart of his goodness, of his graciousness, of his greatness, of his supreme power. And then the psalmist talks to us here in verses 13 about his great name. Because of his great name, you see, he has a name that endures forever. He is forever the same. He never diminishes in his goodness. He will not be less good to us tomorrow than what he's been today. He will not be less good to us today than what he was yesterday. His goodness, his graciousness, his greatness and his power never diminish. They never change. The divine person is renowned through all generations. He is immutable. He is fixed. He will not love me any less today than what he loved me yesterday. He will not love me any more tomorrow than he loves me just now. And even when you and I are faithless, needing to be disciplined, he remains unchanging in his compassion and unchanging in his relationship to his people. The old hymn puts it like this, prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. But my dear friends, he's always there. He's always been there. And he always will be there. And when darkness hides his lovely face, we can rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, our anchor holds within the veil. You see, from verses 15 through to 18, he is the living God. He is the infinitely superior God compared to the dumb idols of the pagan nations. They are silver and gold. They're tarnished. They're corrupted. They need polished. They cannot hear. They are lifeless. They need to be propped up. And those who make them will be like them. They will be dead. You see the folly here of idolatry. One of the modern sins of the 21st century. Sometimes we acquitted idolatry with things that missionaries would have shared with us in deputation in the jungles of Africa, in the Amazon River. But my dear friends, idolatry is bigger than that and broader than that. The modern idols that you and I face, the things that we see, the things that we can handle, the things that we can touch, they can become an idol and rob us of a sense of God's presence and a sense of God's peace. Do you remember in that hymn, Oh, for a closer walk with God? He talks about tearing the idols from our throne. Help me to tear it from thy throne, whatever that idol be, and worship only thee. 
Here we have the ever-living, unchanging, eternal God, full of wisdom, full of compassion, full of goodness, a God who is just and righteous, a God who is gracious. There is no God like Jehovah. The invitation here uh, to praise him, the motivation uh, to praise him. And then you will see in conclusion, there is the exhortation uh, to praise him. The exhortation to praise him. Uh, the psalm concludes with an exhortation to all believers uh, to praise the Lord. Uh, to address, address to all who are assembled in the temple. The call to worship is extended to all who fear God, to all who know him. Now, of course, we need to understand uh, this word fear. There is a harmful fear. There is a harmful fear. Uh, there's a harmful fear that paralyzes people uh, and it gives them great emotional disturbance. There is a healthy fear. We teach our children and our grandchildren to be careful how they cross the road, to be careful who they talk to, uh, to be careful uh, where they go and who they get involved with. And then, of course, there is a holy fear. And that holy fear is the beginning of true wisdom. The world is in an awful turmoil tonight. The world is in an awful dilemma tonight because of the absence of holy fear. There is no fear of God in our world tonight. And as a believer, I need to be very careful that the world doesn't begin to infiltrate my thinking. Doesn't begin to infiltrate my actions and my attitudes and the fear of God begins to evaporate we're to have a holy fear and if we have a holy fear then God will always be worthy of our praise we will say with the psalmist I will bless the Lord at all times his praise shall continually be in my mouth let me quickly close and say this as I close tonight. We're to praise God fervently. We're to praise God wholeheartedly. Martha didn't have many clothes. She didn't have many of these world's goods, but she loved the Lord. She went to a church in Glasgow. She used to sit in the gallery, and every now and again her heart was overwhelmed. And she was shouting, praise the Lord. And the minister was used to that, but he, he left the church, not because of her, but the Lord had called him to another church. New minister came. Martha was in the gallery as the weeks went by. She again praised the Lord. And that upset this minister. He wasn't used to that sort of thing. So on one occasion, he was visiting her, and it was approaching winter. And, and he looked around, and he saw the sparsity of her home. And he thought to himself, he said, Martha, you love the Lord. Oh, she says, I do, your reverence. I love the Lord. He says, you love the praise. Oh, she says, I do. He says, sometimes that puts me off a wee bit. But I notice that uh, you have a great deal of things in the house to keep you warm. I was thinking of buying you some blankets for the winter. Oh, she says, your reverence, that would be great. That would be great. I would appreciate that. Well, there's just one wee thing. Uh, I would like you to consider, if I get you this bra uh, these blankets, would you refrain when you're in church from praising the Lord? Martha thought of a, a, a hard winter coming. And she thought of the warmth of the blankets. And so she did a deal with the minister. And one morning she was sitting in the congregation and the minister was exhorting the Lord, exalting the Saviour. Martha's heart was overwhelmed, bursting. She could stick it no longer. She shouted out, blankets are no blankets. Praise the Lord. You know, have we lost our passion for praising God? Have we lost our fervency, our wholeheartedness 
lukewarmness is a terrible sin. We're to praise God continually in good times and in bad times. Turn quickly for a moment to give you an example of this. In Acts chapter 16, time is moving on. Acts chapter 16. This is the story of Cove, uh, uh, of the gospel coming uh, to Europe. And uh, we, we, we come into the chapter where Paul and Silas were being blessed by God. And the slave girl had been wondrously converted. And verse 19 of Acts 16, But when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, I'm reading from the ESV, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, These men are Jews and they're disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept their practice. The crowd joined in attacking them and the magistrates uh, tore the garments off them and gave orders to uh, beat them with rods and when they had inflicted many blows upon them they threw them into prison ordering the jailer to keep them safely having received this order he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks about midnight Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God and listen, underline this I've underlined this in my Bible and the prisoners were listening to them. They had never heard anything like this before. They'd heard people grumbling and moaning and complaining because they were accused in the wrong. And they were mistreated and mishandled. But here are two men praising God. Why? Because of the grace of God. You see, the grace of God not only brings salvation, the grace of God gives you a song even in the darkest hour. The prisoners were listening. We're to praise God fervently. We're to praise God continually. We're to praise God publicly. We're to praise God privately. I find it sometimes helpful when I have my quiet times reading the Bible to have my hymn book near to me. And sometimes I turn up a hymn and I sing that hymn. You know, we're to praise him in the private place. And we're to praise him informatively. We're to praise him in response to who he is, in response to what he has done. And the more we get to know him, the more we love him. And the more we love him, the more we praise him. And from that swell of praise, we will serve him. What a psalm. A psalm that instructs us. A psalm that motivates us. A psalm that exhorts us. Anthony Collins was a famous agnostic who wrote a book entitled Discourse on Free Thinking. He was a man who was filled with humanistic philosophy. And in it he sought to dismantle any thought that his readers would have about God. God was nothing and man was everything. One Sunday he encountered a poor laboring man on his way to church. And so he thought he would belittle him. Where are you going? He said. The old man said, I'm going to church. I'm going to worship God. And attempting to confuse the simple man, Collins asked him sarcastically, Is your God a great God? Or is your God a little God? And without blinking an eye or pausing for breath, the man responded, my God is so great that the heavens of heavens can't contain him. And my God is so small that he can dwell within my lowly heart. Collins was speechless and years later he referred to the incident. And he said that it had a profound effect upon his life. How big is our God. The psalmist says, Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. With that in mind, let's just bow in the Lord's presence tonight. And let's just thank Him. Praise Him. Thank Him for saving you tonight. 
Thank you for keeping you. Thank you for the measure. Thank you for the measure of health and strength that enables you to be here tonight. Praise him. Isaac Watts writes in his hymn, Thou art coming to a king. Large petitions with thee bring.